about it in literature? It's different in beer and it's different in wine. It's the original aphrodisiac. Downtown Prescott's whiskey guzzling legacy has some stiff competition. Hi everyone, I'm Robin Sewell and today on Arizona Highways, a side of Prescott you might not know existed. It's like a speakeasy. We're going downstairs to experience a new undertaking of an old tradition. Our mission is to reintroduce the world's oldest fermented beverage to mankind. With a sidecar of history. Because people have forgotten. It's been lost and we're bringing it back. And memorializing an Arizona artist. This entire sculpture weighs about 3,000 pounds. A 16-inch sculpture transformed nearly 15 feet tall. A bronze foundry preserving the cowboy way of life. We are in the West, we're in Prescott right now, and we see this on a daily basis, but it's really slowly going away. Plus, a favorite meal inspired by art. That's how we decided the Velvet Elvis, which has nothing to do with Elvis, it has to do with his, with his art form that, is, uh, that has quite a history. In Southern Arizona, Elvis and pizza are the perfect combination. Do you shoot it? Small sip. No, small no, no. Sip. Oh, small sorry. Sip. Okay. Small Don't sip. Talk when you're Do doing I swirl it. it in my mouth? You can if you want. <laughs> Don't talk when you're doing it. Okay. And tasting liquid gold. The only thing that we're limited by is our imagination and one or two laws. People that come here in particular, they're a little bit more adventurous. They're not just going somewhere to get a vodka soda or a Jack and Coke or a beer. We are drinking adult beverages here in historic downtown Prescott, but this isn't Whiskey Row. There's always good music playing, the lights are dim, like it's, it's very different than anywhere else in Prescott. It's just, it's relaxing and it's, it's cool, it's pretty hip. Um, there's a lot of good looking people that work here, which is, you know, it's nice to have eye candy. <laughs> so. We are across the street at Arizona's first meadery, in the basement of the old Capitol Market Building. Our mission is to reintroduce the world's oldest fermented beverage to mankind. Everything we do Jeff is Herbert is the owner and founder of Superstition Meadery. Mead is the most delicious beverage you will ever get to try. It's different in beer and it's different in wine. It's fermented honey, and what's not to like? Making mead started out as a side hustle for Jeff Herbert, but he has clearly created a loyal following, and that buzz is spreading. This place is 100% the reason that I first started to like mead. I heard about it in literature, you know, it comes up there and in myths and stuff, but I'd never tried it, I didn't think it was still made. Jeff says that's part of what makes mead so exciting. Because we're bringing it back, it's new now, so it's the newest, oldest, thing that you can drink. There are now more than 500 meteries in the U.S. and growing. There's a meadery opening on average every three days in the U.S. Like craft beer or wine. There's a lot of science in what we do. And with science comes science experiments. There's also this magical side when it comes to say barrel aging where sometimes you just don't know what you're gonna get and there's some aha moments, some discoveries that you make. And of course, there is the unique atmosphere you've been hearing about that the building itself helps create. When you look around, the wood on the walls is Ponderosa wood from Arizona. And in Prescott, there's so much history in this town that makes it a fun place to live as well. This town burned down, eight or nine blocks burned down in 1900 in a fire. And so this building was built in 1901. And I can tell you where the wood came from on the front of our bar. And I can tell you where the wood came from on our walls. That includes salvaged wood from the Wallow Fire, the largest wildland fire in Arizona history. You can't buy that at Home Depot. I come to the tasting room for two reasons, and that's to be alone and just have space to myself, enjoy a wonderful glass of whatever they have on tap. I also really like coming down here for dates <laughs> because it's, the ambiance is so nice, so warm, and it's a wonderful icebreaker because you order a flight, you can try all sorts of different things. So if you have nothing else to talk about, you can talk about all these different flavors that you're experiencing together and get into a really good dialogue about it. So it's great for, for the alone time and for the dates, especially the dates. <laughs> so let's talk about what mead tastes like. It's got a sweetness to it, but yet a 
sour tone on the back side. I feel it in the back here. Um, tastes a lot of berries. And I like it, very good. This tastes like wildflower honey, raspberry, blueberry, blackberry, vanilla, which is exactly what's in it. Mead, it can be as dry as the desert or so sweet that it makes you smile. So it can be anywhere in between. It's got a little bit of coffee-ness to it. And it's really exciting to be a part of something that we get to define, we get to say what it is. There's no rules. It, the, the only thing that we're limited by is our imagination and one or two laws. Next door, on the third floor of Bashford Courts, is a very different kind of tasting room. Bill, most people go wine tasting, but here in this store, you actually do olive oil tasting. That's correct. As well as tasting balsamic vinegars here at Olive U Naturally. You know, when you go wine tasting, what they do is they have a little cup and you kind of swirl the, the wine in your mouth and you spit it out and then they have coffee beans you smell it. Do you have all that? Please don't spit. Okay, I won't okay. spit. So all I do is I just put a little bit in here. It's like being at an Italian restaurant. And this one is, say it again? Green chili. Green chili. It's just like, oh my gosh, that's got a kick to it. <laughs> I warned you. Now understand, with the combination of 52 flavors here, if you factor those 52 flavors, you end up with more than 2 million possible combinations. And these are taste-tested winning combinations. Oils and vinegars from all of you Naturally's suppliers were served at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. They could be considered liquid gold. All the balsamics start with this one. This okay. is our number one seller. This is an 18-year-old balsamic vinegar. Has no flavor other than balsamic vinegar as one ingredient in must of grape, aged 18 years in different types of barrels. Do you shoot it? Small sip, no, small no, sip. no, small oh, sorry. sip. Okay, small Don't sip. Talk when you're Do doing I swirl it. it in my mouth? Do you want. <laughs> Don't talk when you're doing it. Okay. That's 18 year old Ooh. balsamic vinegar. That's good. Now, from this one, okay. you start getting these flavors. Oh. Okay, this is Black cherry balsamic. Oh, so we have more balsamic. Do balsamic. I need to eat anything to get the other one out of my mouth? The taste? No, just no. try it. Okay, just try it. Tastes like black cherry, doesn't it? it? Tastes like black cherry soda. Okay, now I'm going to take that black cherry balsamic and I'm going to make it. I'm going to change the flavor of it by putting an olive oil with it. In this oh. case, I'm going to put blood orange olive oil. This is quite the culinary experience. It is. After you're done tasting, it's time to start adding these oils and vinegars in your cooking. I'm sure everybody has their own personal favorite. Here's my favorite. personal favorite. All right, what is okay. it? Okay, I tenderize steaks with this. I put it in meatloaf, I put it in chili sauce, I put it in spaghetti sauce, I put it on ice cream and cake. What? What? Okay, can, are you going to tell me what it is? Espresso? This Wait, this is espresso vinegar? Balsamic, yep. you you got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm going to smell, do this like you do you know, in your wine taste. Okay. There you have it. You gotta be kidding. That tastes like I had espresso bean. That is delicious. That's what it's supposed to taste like. Wow! <laughs> it is another unique drinking experience in downtown Prescott. Arizona Highways Television is brought to you by Arizona Public Service and the Arizona Office of Tourism. When you think of pizza, you think of cheese, sausage, and pepperoni. But Elvis? Well, of all things, it was a velvet Elvis painting that helped get a small pizza restaurant up and running. And the town of Patagonia all shook up. This little place has, has uh, created not only pizza, but it's the culture, the, the music, the, the colors, the celebration of the Southwest. And to think, it all started with a painting of Elvis. It wasn't uh, because I love Elvis or because I really wanted to honor the king or because it just came in a very, very 
unusual way. We need a name that people will remember and that, they ha that it has a point of reference. It has to do with this, with this art form that, is, uh, that has quite a history from the 70s, you know, and started in, in Mexico. And we wanted to come up with a name that linked both countries, Mexico and the United States, being so close to the border. And nothing did it better than velvet, or rather Elvis and velvet. Owner Cecilia San Miguel was searching for not just a new name for her restaurant, but a new life. I had moved to Patagonia after my husband died. And for the first time in my life, I was alone. My children had, were grown up and they had left. Uh, they were on their own. And now I found myself a woman alone for the first time. And so the whole, the whole world just was, was open to me. Is that, what, what could I do? When I came to Patagonia, I didn't know anyone. And so starting from the very beginning, finding my way in a very strange surrounding um, with no family, so Patagonia became my, my extended family. And it was that extended family that helped her get started. And so it's been nothing but a series of miracles that the way that we ended up opening the Velvet Elvis. One of the people who was um, the, the partners uh, had worked, because this was a bakery before, Ovens of Patagonia. And um, she said, the best day that we have in the restaurant was Fridays because we order, we offered pizza. And so, whatever you do, make sure that you offer pizza in the bakery. Cecilia decided to serve up pizza not just on Fridays, but every day of the week, along with soups and salads. And with the help of a local, a side of Elvis. Somebody in town already had this painting. And they show up with this painting and they said, Cecilia, we have it in storage. We cannot give it to you. We cannot sell it to you. It can be on permanent loan. So this has been on permanent loan for the last 16 years. But it was just amazing. You know, the painting was already here. Local friends also suggest new pizza recipes, which Cecilia willingly tries and puts on the menu. I have been cooking most of my life, you know, and that has been part of my excitement. I mean, I really enjoy cooking. I'm not a trained chef. I learned to cook with my grandmother. So when I'm preparing the food or when I'm talking about making the soups, you know, she, she, the, the presence is there. Besides Elvis, her restaurant is filled with Cecilia paintings by local artists. It's part of creating the environment, it's part of creating the beauty, and it's also making the connection with, with the local people. So there is a, a kind of an ownership that develops, you know, when you say, my artwork is a Velvet Elvis. It's like an extended family. Most Arizonans are familiar with the Bucky O'Neill Monument. It's been proudly keeping watch outside the Prescott Courthouse since 1907. The detailed bronze statue captures the spirit of Captain William O'Neill, one of Teddy Roosevelt's famed Rough Riders, and one of Prescott's leading men. He served as Yavapai County Judge, Sheriff, then Mayor of Prescott, all before joining the first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry. But O'Neill never came back to Arizona. He died in Cuba fighting in the Spanish-American War. Prescott now has another bronze monument, this one honoring cowboy artist George Fippen. I think that he had no idea of what it would become today. This is George Fippen's last sculpture. He died in 1966. Now, Cowboy in a Storm has been reimagined. 
It's been recreated to stand larger than life, greeting you in the roundabout in front of the Phippen Museum. A lot of people have copied George Phippen or copied this idea of the calf and the horse. He was one of the originals. Ed Riley is the owner of Bronsmith Fine Art Foundry and Gallery in Prescott Valley. He and his team have brought this enormous project to life. The Cowboy in the Storm is not only uh, a beautiful piece of art, but it's really a feat in engineering and in, in, in foundry work. They have stayed true to the artist's vision, just on a bigger scale. We've taken this 16-inch tall sculpture and enlarged it to 14 and a half feet. Where I'm standing underneath the horse's uh, belly right here, it gives you some uh, idea of scale of how big this piece is. This entire sculpture weighs about 3,000 pounds. This has 65 separate large castings that are welded together to make this image. There is a lot of people that are involved in this sculpture beyond the artist, and because George has passed away, his son Lauren and someone else that has worked closely with Lauren, Deb Gessner, our house sculptor, has worked really hard on this. It's kind of a culture keeper type of project here for Prescott. We see this on a daily basis, but it's really slowly going away. I think it really still needs to be recorded, and I think it still needs to have a place in history because little by little, uh, modern American society is eroding this way of life. Later on in the tour, you're going to get to see how we uh, melt the metal and pour the bronze right into the ceramic shell. It, it's really something. It's alchemy at its best. Arizona Highways Television is brought to you by Arizona Public Service and the Arizona Office of Tourism. So where did the idea to paint Elvis on velvet come from? Well, many people, including those in the art world, think of velvet paintings as kind of tacky. Well, we're gonna introduce you to one Tucson artist who's trying to change all that. Meet Diane Bombshelter. Well, I, I've always had a kitschy sensibility. Believe it or not, velvet is a valid artistic medium with roots in the mid-century. My, the, my main influence on why I wanted to paint on black velvet was Edgar Lee Tag, and he painted in the late 50s. And he did mostly Tahitian women. Um, he did some men too, but he lived in Tahiti. And uh, that's basically how the black velvet painting really got popular, was because of him. The other influence would be from Mexico. Uh, you know, the a lot of people recognize like the Elvises and but I think that is another reason why black velvet painting became ubiquitous in the 50s and 60s um, mostly from I would say the Polynesian paintings and the Mexican paintings. Working on black velvet is the exact opposite of a white canvas. You paint highlights using the velvet as shadows. The velvet also provides a unique depth and texture. I would say there's two camps. There's people that think of velvet painting like, oh my God, that's so awful. Because they think of sad clowns and, and Elvis and, and big eyed children, you know? But then there's this other camp that, oh, I love velvet paintings because almost for the same reasons, but they love it for that stuff because it's kitschy. What I'm trying to do is make people see that it can be um, even more than that. I'm trying to open people's eyes and change their perception of, of what they think black velvet painting is. Welcome to Bronsmith Fine Art Foundry and Gallery in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Today we're going to do a tour of the foundry. We're going to show you how bronze sculptures are made. We have a unique facility here because we have a working foundry and a gallery and a sculpture garden for people to view and see how things are done. We start out by doing uh, the uh, enlargement process and the mold making process. Here's an example of a sculpture by Doug Hyde. Uh, this is a small one that we did at first, okay? This is a bronze now, but he had the idea of an uh, Indian lady throwing some baskets up in the air and then talking about all the uh, symbols 
and the uh, mythology that's in, in the designs of the baskets. So what we do is we take this, we do a digital scan of it, and then make a foam uh, carving, and then we apply clay to it. Then at the end, the artist comes in and puts the finishing touches on it. After this is finished, then we go to the mold making process. That is a system of dividing whatever we're gonna cast in two pieces. So that's what Grover's doing here. He's got one piece that's already uh, had one side of the mold done and he's making what we call the pour cone. That's where um, the uh, hot wax is gonna go inside of the rubber mold to be poured in and out. Now comes that hot wax, 240 degrees. It's slowly poured over the mold. The hot wax picks up all the fine details in the artist's original sculpture. After several coats, the mold is closed up and a slightly cooler wax is poured inside and out. We then have a hollow wax pattern that we do what we call touch-up. And touch-up is taking some of the original tools that the artist uses to um, create the piece in the beginning, we use those same tools to clean up the seam line or any flaws that might be in there. The next step involves applying actual metal to the ceramic shell. After several coats, the wax is steamed out and they're ready for the bronze pour. As you can see, this will be another hot pour, more than 2,000 degrees. At this stage of the game, we're only halfway through the process time-wise. The second half is the laborious process of cleaning all this up, grinding the gates down, doing the metal finishing, and then finally the patina. Now we're in the uh, finished chasing room. This is where all the sculptures that are cast in pieces are put together. This is where you can actually see the original artist's vision coming together. Milky Way Woman depicts a woman in tribal dress holding up baskets amid the stars. It's based on the idea that when people pass, they go to the Milky Way. It's works like this one that earned artist Doug Hyde the 2018 Governor's Award for Artist of the Year. One of the comments people make all the time is they had no idea that it was that complicated. They think that the, the, the mold somehow, a bronze sculpture pops out of it. It's all done in parts and pieces. So. Uh, this is part of what we want to show at Bronsmith. We want to show how much work goes into it, how it's really a partnership with the artist. The artist is working very closely with us. Their vision is somehow brought to life here. When, he comes, when the metal comes to Bronsmith, it's in an ingot about 15 or 20 pounds, and then we transform that into their vision or their beautiful piece of art. Arizona Highways Television is brought to you by Arizona Public Service and the Arizona Office of Tourism. From memorializing an Arizona artist who memorialized the West romance with the cowboy. The Cowboy in the Storm is not only a beautiful piece of art, but it's really a feat in engineering and in, in, in foundry work. I think we're a little bit lucky that when we decided to start a meadery in Arizona, we just happened to find a place that has amazing honey. Certainly a super fan. It's like the oldest beverage ever made. There's something a little primal about it. To the hot new trend in adult beverages. We're doing something really special here, and I think that if you come and visit us in Prescott, you won't have to look very far to find something amazing. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. I'm Robin Sewell and we'll see you on the next Arizona Highways.